Okay, so with the quizzes, um, I still record them, okay? All the answers that I just did there, okay? And I do post them, right? But I don't post them like publicly, so you wouldn't be able to like search for them on YouTube or something like that. But in your grade book, okay? So if you go into Power School, okay, and you're looking at your grades, you know how they're arranged by, you know, individual tasks. If you click on them, you can see the details, okay? If you click on one of your individual tasks, Okay, before you go, okay, before you go, okay, um, if you click on those, okay, and it shows you the details of the task, there will be two links. One link will say quiz two questions. If you click on that, it'll take you to the document I posted on Google Classroom last night, so the questions, okay? The second one will say podcast of quiz two. If you click on that, it's an automatic link to the recording I just made of the quiz, and then if you're studying for your unit exam or final exam, sometimes it's good to go over those again, especially if it's a quiz you didn't do well on, okay? So you can try it again and then see if you did it right the second time around. All right, those of you who see through E, go get your pictures taken. Okay, for the rest of you, we're gonna talk about properties of compounds. So we're gonna be looking at ionic compounds and molecular compounds, but not so much about the naming, just what are ionic compounds like? What are molecular compounds like? Okay, the information in this lesson is what you're going to need to do the analysis for the lab we're gonna do on Tuesday. Okay, on Tuesday, we'll be going into the lab and there will be about a dozen unknown materials on the front counter, labeled like A through J or something like that. Okay, and you will have to use their physical properties to identify what they are, okay? I will give you a list of what they could be. And then you'll have to match up, like A is water, and B is hydrochloric acid, and C is alcohol, or whatever it happens to be, okay? You'll have to do that based on what we learn in here about ionic and molecular compounds, okay? So with that in mind, you can kind of get an idea of what pieces of information in this lesson might be important for you. Okay, everybody follow? All right. Okay. So a compound, first off, is a combination of two or more atoms, okay? That's what Dalton's atomic theory said they would be, okay? They can atoms can combine in simple whole number ratios to make compounds, okay? And all matter has certain properties. Some of those are chemical properties, okay? Like how reactive something is, okay? Whether it burns in the presence of oxygen and stuff like that, okay? Um, and then some are physical properties. And physical properties would be things like color and density, melting points, solubility, uh, whether they're electrically conductive, whether they're attracted to a magnet, okay, um, all that kind of stuff. Those are all okay, physical properties. And we'll be using not all of those, obviously, but some of them in our lab to help us identify the materials. Okay, So those properties can be used to distinguish between types of compounds. Now, we're just going to be focusing on ionic versus molecular, and there's enough pretty major differences between them that we'll have no problem identifying what the materials are. Okay. So four ionic compounds, okay? Ionic compounds with like a very few, like basically no exceptions, are crystalline solids at room temperature. Okay, so that means that they're, they have hard, small crystals, okay, that are present, okay, and that is what they look like at room temperature. Now the crystals are all different, okay? No two ionic compounds have perfectly identical crystals, right, but salt, is an example of an ionic compound. Okay. Sugar is not. Okay, so I didn't say all crystalline substances are ionic compounds, but I did say that all ionic compounds are crystalline solids at room temperature. Everyone follow the difference? Okay, okay. one is true, the other, the reverse is not. Okay, all right. So they're all ionic. They're, sorry, they're all crystalline solids at room temperature. They have very very high melting points. Okay, like ridiculously high. Several hundred degrees would be one of the lowest ones. Okay. Um, and ionic compounds will conduct electricity if they are dissolved in water. Okay, weird thing about water. Perfectly distilled water, pure water, does not conduct electricity. Okay, the, the issue with like being in a pool when, a light, when lightning strikes is that the pool is full of ions. That's what makes it smell funny. Okay, you know how they always say they put chlorine in a pool? Well, it's not just like chlorine. Chlorine is a gas. They don't bubble chlorine gas through the pool. They put compounds in that release chlorine into the water, and that keeps bacteria and fungus from growing. Okay. 
F through G and H. So F through H. Go. Okay. All right. So um, that's how kind of that works. Okay. Um, the reason that ionic compounds will conduct electricity in water is because of what we talked about the other day. Okay. An ionic bond is very weak. It's very weak because they just trade the electrons. One of the elements, the non-metal, needs electrons, and one of the elements, the metal, needs to get rid of electrons, and once they've done that, they don't need each other anymore. Remember how we said that's not a recipe for real life success. Okay, but okay, that's what happens in the ionic compound, and as a result, those particles now are charged. Okay, the non-metals have an extra electron. They have one more electron than they have protons, so they're negatively charged, or maybe they have two more. Okay, and then the metals have lost an electron or two or three, and they're positively charged. As a result, because there are charged particles in the solution, electricity can flow. Okay? If there are no charged particles in the solution, electricity won't flow because it needs to be able to move from charged particle to charged particle. Everybody follow? Okay, so that's like the simple and unequivocal test that will always tell you whether a material is ionic or molecular is to check whether its solution conducts electricity. Okay, that will always tell you it's definitely ionic. So as an example, in that lab that we're doing, one of the materials is salt and one of them is sugar. Okay, to the naked eye, they look pretty much the same and you're not allowed to do taste tests. Okay, because some of them are not something you'd want on your tongue, or you won't have a tongue. Okay, so yeah, don't, no taste test. Okay, but sugar, uh, yes, you can smell, but salt and sugar, they, they don't have much of a smell, either one of them, right? So they look visibly the same, but sugar is a molecular compound, and salt is ionic. Okay, so when you get to the point where, like, I can't tell which one's which, dissolve them both in water, one will conduct, the other won't. Okay, and then you'll know which one's the ionic compound, salt, and which one's the molecular compound, sugar. Everybody follow there? Okay. All right. So if we're looking at like a, a single ionic compound's crystal, you know, under a microscope, it would look something like this. Okay, they're small, but they have you know kind of a geometric shape to them, right? Um, some ionic compounds, depending on the metal, will be brightly colored, and we'll talk about the special exceptions there that have. Uh, specific colors, okay? And this diagram here on the far right is showing us why, okay, an ionic compound dissolved in water conducts electricity, okay? So all the little blue and red molecules, okay, these ones here, those are all water molecules, right? And they're surrounding the charged particles. That would be this sodium ion, because it's lost an electron and is now positively charged, and this chlorine ion, which has gained an electron and is now negatively charged. Because those are present, electricity can flow through that solution. Okay, But distilled water will not conduct electricity. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so big things off of this slide. Ionic compounds are crystalline solids. And their solutions conduct electricity. Okay, that's big news for this slide. Okay. Many ionic compounds produce colored solutions, the same color as their crystals usually. Okay. Um, so what we have here are some of the ones that do that. Anything that contains copper will make a blue solution and usually has blue crystals. Okay. Any compound containing nickel will have green crystals and as a result, a green solution. And any cobalt containing compounds, okay, will tend to be red to pink. Wow, they're going really fast. Okay, off you go. Okay, uh, so that, that makes sense. Those are the kind of the big ones. So if you're looking at all of these unknown compounds and you've got, oh, I got a green one, I got a red one, I got a blue one, pretty good bet I know what those ones are when I look at my list and one of my unknowns has copper in it. It's probably the blue one. Now, do I want to just go probably the blue one or do I want to run some other tests to confirm? Yeah, run some other tests to confirm, dissolve it in water, check to see if its solution conducts electricity, all those kind of things, okay, to help confirm that yes, it's an ionic compound, so it's probably it's most definitely this one. Okay? So, those are ones to know, and the other thing has to do with solubility. Okay? Ionic compounds, oh, that's not a good code to use. Okay, 
are generally, okay, so that means most of the time, okay, quite soluble. Okay, they are generally quite soluble. Strains that we keep sending them, but not as many are coming back. Oh, okay. Just skip die. It's probably not a letter that most people's last names start with. It's weird because it's a vowel, right? Most people's names start with a consonant. Okay. Um, so things here about ionic compounds. Okay, so these are kind of the big things, okay? especially these colored ones, because that can really help you to quickly identify something, okay, based on, so, you know, out of the A through J, out of the dozen of them, you might be able to identify three out of 12, okay, um, just based on color. So that can be helpful. Okay, molecular compounds, okay? Molecular compounds can be any state because they have much lower melting points in general, okay? So they can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas at room temperature. So if you have something that is a liquid in the lab on Tuesday, you know automatically it's a molecular compound, unless I give you one that's in solution, and then I would tell you. Okay, so if there was one and it was in a beaker and it looked like a liquid, okay, and it's not, I would say this is a solution of an ionic compound, okay? so that you would know, and I would tell you what that ionic compound looked like when it was a solid. Problem is, with some compounds, we can't actually order them in their solid form, okay? They have to come to us in a solution already because they're safer to transport that way, right? So that may come up, right? But I will tell you, that one's not a liquid. That is a solid dissolved in water already, and then you'll know, okay? Um, all right, so they have very low melting and boiling points. So examples would be things like butter. Okay. Butter is a molecular compound. It has a very low melting point, right? It's made of like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, okay? Uh, and it can melt in your hand, okay? If you put butter in your hand, it'll start to melt in your hand. It has a very low melting point. Same with things like lard, okay, and stuff like that. Um, water, molecular compound, okay? It's a liquid at room temperature. Alcohol, okay? It's in the liquid at room temperature, okay? It's, it's a molecular compound. Oil is molecular, yeah, because okay. it's made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, okay? It's organic, but organic molecules are molecular. All right, so molecular compounds are not usually as soluble, okay? I mean, oil and water separate when you pour them into each other, right? Like butter doesn't really dissolve in water, okay? Stuff like that, okay? So they're not usually as soluble, okay? Uh, and they do not conduct electricity because even if they dissolve, okay, they don't do this. An ionic compound breaks up into its positives and negatives, but a, a molecular compound doesn't have charged particles. Remember, we talked about how their bond is really, really strong. So they dissolve, but they stay together, right? And as a result, there's no charged particles to carry the charge. Okay, so there's no charged particles to carry the, the current through that material. Right, so if you're testing things and you're coming up with a bunch of them, a bunch of solutions that are not conducting electricity, you know that you are looking at molecular compounds for those materials, right? And then you can say, oh, well, I know that's not calcium chloride because it didn't conduct electricity. Maybe it's something else, okay? And you could look on your chart and go, oh, well, that's a molecular compound. That's a molecular compound. Maybe it's one of those. Everybody follow? It's going to be kind of a process of elimination okay, kind of thing when you're doing your analysis there. Okay, uh, so not as soluble as ionic compounds, okay? They don't break into positive and negative ions, and they generally produce clear solutions, okay? There's not going to be many brightly colored um, molecular solutions. Okay, questions there? Right. Now, acids and bases, okay? Um, there's different kinds of acids and bases, but we'll start with acids, okay? There are strong acids, and then there are weak acids, okay? Strong acids would be things like sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, okay, uh, nitric acid, things like that, okay? Weak acids would be things like citric acid, okay, that you'd find in fruit, okay? Um, 
depending on the concentration, like vinegar is a diluted form of acetic acid, which can be a weaker acid if it's diluted, okay? Stuff like that, right? Those would be weaker acids. Lactic acid, which is, you know, a byproduct of working your muscles uh, when there isn't enough oxygen is a weak acid. If it wasn't, it would dissolve your muscles, right? That would be good, okay? These are all weak acids, right? Strong acids are ionic compounds, okay? Strong acids are ionic compounds, and they always contain hydrogen acting as the metal, Okay, so examples, like we said here, this is hydrochloric acid. Okay, hydrogen is acting as the metal. Okay, chlorine as the non-metal. Okay, when it hits water, it dissolves immediately. Okay, it is highly soluble. Um, and it breaks up into H plus and Cl minus. Okay, the more H plus ions there are floating around in a solution, the more acidic it's going to be. Okay, so that means that something like this would be more acidic because when I put an equal amount of it into a solution, I get twice as many hydrogen ions in that solution. Everybody okay with that? Okay, this one would be really dangerous. Okay, that's nitric acid. Very, very dangerous stuff because every time it goes into solution, it donates three hydrogen ions into that solution. Okay. Um, we actually did a lab when I was in high school with this stuff. And um, one of the groups had the volleyball team's setter and power hitter in it. And they were, um, they had left the container of nitric acid open and they were doing their lab right next to the open container. The fumes were absorbed by their skin. They didn't actually spill any of it on them, but as it evaporated, the evaporated, the fumes got onto their hands, it was absorbed by their skin, and within hours, their hands were covered in giant festering blisters, okay? They had to have them all wrapped, and they were out for like two weeks, okay? I mean, can you imagine trying to set when your hands are covered in like chemical burns, okay? Yeah, that's what they got. So yeah, you have to be very, very careful with strong acids, okay? All right, so strong acids, because they're ionic compounds, are going to conduct electricity. In fact, they will be your best conductors in the lab, okay? Strong acids and strong bases will be your best conductors of electricity. If I say something twice and I like slow down and enunciate it, you should write it down because it'll really help you out later. That's just an exercise in note-taking. Okay? You guys probably haven't learned that before, but if somebody says something more than one time, Okay, and they slow down and they look you in the eye as best they can when there's 30 of you and one of him. Okay, it's, it's definitely important. All right, and acidic solutions have low pH, that is less than 7. And one of the tests that you're going to run in this lab is a pH test. Right, we'll give you the hydrion paper that changes into like 13 different colors. Okay, and it'll turn red if it's an acid, it'll turn like almost like a dark navy blue to black if it's a strong base, and then there's a whole bunch of colors in the middle, okay, for every level on the pH scale. Okay, um, so like we said, they're ionic compounds, so they share a lot of those properties. They're crystalline solids, they're highly soluble, okay, and like we said, they will be very strong conductors. All right. Bases are the opposite, okay? So bases have a very high pH. Strong bases are ionic compounds. Weak bases are not, okay? So um, sodium hydroxide, which is the active ingredient in oven cleaner, okay? if you've ever sprayed that white foamy stuff inside your oven to clean it or your parents have, okay? That contains sodium hydroxide. It's an incredibly strong base and a base can be just as caustic, that means has the ability to like dissolve stuff as a strong acid, okay? Which is why you use it to dissolve all the burnt on crud that's inside of your oven, okay? So sodium hydroxide is a very strong base because it contains hydroxide. All strong bases contain that polyatomic ion that we learned about the other day, okay? All 
All right, so bases, like we said, strong bases are ionic compounds, okay? And they'll conduct electricity in solution. They'll also be highly soluble, even though it doesn't say that in here. Okay, and they typically taste bitter, whereas acids typically taste tart. Not that that's going to be helpful to you in the lab because I've already said this, I think the fourth time, we're not going to taste anything in the lab, okay? Because you don't want to taste the stuff that's in oven cleaner or it'll do to your tongue what it does to the crud inside your oven, dissolve it, okay? And we don't want that. Okay, so on a pH a piece of hydrion paper, you're gonna get blue to kind of like blackish, okay, um, depending on the strength of the acid for these. Okay. Questions on the property to bases? Okay. So on Tuesday, when we're doing this lab, okay, we're going to be running a few tests and you'll probably just want to add these to wherever you're writing right now. Okay. Um, Okay, tests for the properties of compounds lab. The first test that you're going to run is what we call the observable properties tests. Okay, this requires you to add nothing to the material. Okay, this is just looking at the material and using your five senses, okay, in order to write down everything that you can see or, um, well, mostly see, because you're not going to touch or taste. You might smell, okay, some of these materials, all right, but you're not going to have to add anything for this test. All we're doing is looking for the most basic and obvious physical properties, all right? So in this, this uh, test, we would record things like color, Okay, nature, and by nature, I mean, is it like crystalline or is it like waxy, okay, like butter would be waxy, candle wax would be waxy, okay, uh, things like that. So if it's crystalline, then, you know, it's likely ionic. If it's not crystalline, but it's a solid, then it would be uh, something else, okay. Um, we would also record the state, okay, you're only going to have solids and liquids here, okay. It's really hard to run this lab with a gas because I can't put it in a beaker for some reason. It seems to just disappear. Yeah, well, I can flip it over, but then when people try and sample it, it goes away. Okay. It's hard to put it in a dish. So um, yeah, you won't have any gases, just solids and liquids. Okay, so um, color, nature, we might have odor. Okay, would be another one. How should you smell something you don't know what it is? Yeah, waft it, okay? So that means like hold it, you know, about a, let's say, you know, 20 centimeters or so from your face, okay? And do this, all right? You waft it towards you. Very few of the materials we're going to have in that lab are going to have a smell. But those that do, the smell will be obvious and probably familiar, okay? Uh, so just be aware of that, okay? But what I don't want you to do, you know, you got this, you know, unknown like powder in there and you're like... Okay, we don't, if we do that, we could be inhaling something really, really bad for ourselves and it could burn our lungs and poison us or whatever else, okay? So there's no snorting of the materials, okay? Please and thank you. Um, so odor test, make sure you waft uh, in order to do that, okay? So that, that tells us, you know, some of those kind of basic things that are just observable okay, without having to do anything. All right, the next thing that we'll want to test and we have to do these tests in a certain order because sometimes one test is necessary for another test to be run. And sometimes one test would ruin the results for another. Okay, so the next test we want to do is solubility. All right, so basically we add water to the material and we check to see if it dissolves. In this lab, we're going to be dealing with very, very small amounts 
of each material in a very, very small space. So it's not likely you'd actually be able to get your entire sample to dissolve. But does that mean it's not soluble? Okay, so if you're looking at a solid, how can you tell if it's dissolving? Okay, it might shrink, okay, it might get smaller, it you know, might appear to like starting to disappear. But like we said, we're not gonna get it all to dissolve. Okay, so what are some other signs? Okay, it might bubble, that's usually a sign that it's actually reacting with something else, but that could mean it's dissolving as well. Yeah, of the solvent, that's the word you're looking for. Okay, yeah, so a color change of the solvent, in this case, water. So if I put it on blue crystals and it starts to turn blue, they're dissolving, okay, because they're going into solution. Um, I would also want to look at the edges. If it's crystalline, look at the edges of the crystals. If they go from looking sharp to go to looking round, they're dissolving, okay? Um, what if it's a liquid? How can I tell if a liquid is soluble in water? Yeah, if they mix. Yeah, if they, don't, if they don't separate, then they're soluble. All right, I mean, you know what oil looks like when it sits on top of water. If it doesn't look like that, it's soluble. But it's tougher if it's a clear material, okay? You kind of have to look really carefully to see if it's separating or not. Okay, making sense so far? All right, another thing that you're going to want to check while you're running the solubility test for a change in temperature. Sorry, delta is a symbol we use in science to symbolize change, okay? So delta means change, change in temperature, okay? That means you'll have to have a thermometer in it before you add the water slash as you add the water, okay? Otherwise, you'll miss it, okay? You need to know what the temperature was before and then see if there's any change. Again, we're dealing with really small amounts of everything, so don't expect it to jump 10 degrees, okay? If you see like a three degree change, that was pretty good considering the amount of material we're going to have. So you're gonna have to watch it carefully. Okay, once we have a solution, what do you suppose we wanna check? Because we mentioned it several times when we talked about ionic compounds, right? We wanna run a conductivity test. Okay, we have little conductivity meters, okay? You press a button, you stick it in the solution, and the little numbers light up, okay? It's really easy to tell if it's very conductive or not conductive, okay? It has a scale of one to 10 on it. What do you need to make sure you do each time you use that conductivity tester? Absolutely, clean it off with tap water or distilled water? Distilled water, you will have a small squeeze bottle, okay, with distilled water in it. Make sure you wipe, you uh, rinse off all of your materials, including your thermometer. Anything that gets in the sample has to be rinsed with distilled water before you use it in another sample, or you could contaminate that next sample and then get false results. All right, the last thing we want to test is pH. Okay, that's lowercase p, capital H, stands for power of hydrogen. Okay, how many, how many hydrogen ions would be in it? Okay, the reason we do that last is because the pH paper will put ions into the solution as the reaction that causes the color change occurs. And that would foul up the conductivity test if we try to do it after, okay? So we have to do it in this order. The pH test is what you do last. Dip the pH paper in there, compare it, okay, to the color chart that's on there and you're good to go. Okay, then you'll have a set of observations for each one of your unknown samples and then you'll be able to start figuring out what they are. All right, so if I was looking at my data and sample D was a blue crystalline solid that was highly soluble in water, okay, uh, and conducted electricity and had a pH of like six, so essentially neutral, right? I would say, I would look at my unknowns. Let's say I just have these three unknowns. Okay. Which one would it be? The blue crystalline solid conducts electricity. It, 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 sorry, its solution conducts electricity. It was highly soluble in water and had a pH of six. It'd be copper sulfate, okay? That's what you're gonna do in the labs. You're gonna have a list of the identities, but you won't know which identity goes with which unknown, and that'll be your job in the analysis is to assign identities to the unknown compounds 
based on your observations. All right. Now, there are a few kind of weird compounds that are out there. Okay. Uh, one of the weird ones, and it's going to be one of your unknowns, is this. Is that an ionic compound or a molecular compound? Not in this one. Does it have a lot of different elements in it? It's ammonium nitrate. Okay. And is that an ionic compound or a molecular compound? It's ionic because ammonium is a polyatomic ion and so is nitrate. Okay. So this is one of the really strange ionic compounds that's actually made of two polyatomic ions. This is the active ingredient in those um, cold packs, you know, where you pop the water blister inside and you shake it up and it gets cold. This is the stuff that's the solid inside of there. Okay? It's the crystals that are inside. When it dissolves in water, it gets colder. Okay? It's one of your unknowns in the lab on Tuesday. Should you be watching for something in particular on one of the tests on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay, now, since it's ionic, it's going to be a solid. Not just a solid, but it'll also be a, what kind of solid? A crystalline solid. Okay, that means it'll be hard. Not necessarily like square, but hard. Okay, a crystalline solid. All right, so when you're doing this lab, guys, if you're stuck, like you're like, I can't figure out what, what B is, okay, but you still have like three things left, it's fine to Google them, okay? Like you could say, I don't, I've got this, this material left and just Google its properties and see what it says, okay? If it matches up with what you have, well, that, that's not cheating, okay? it's using the resources at hand, okay? Hopefully you'd be able to figure it out on your own, but you know, if you're kind of stuck at the end, there, that would be okay too. Okay. All right, does everyone kind of follow where we're going with this properties of compound stuff? Okay, so your next quiz, on Tuesday might have some of this stuff in it because it'd be really good to review it right before we go and do the lab. Okay. On Monday, we'll have the Chromebooks in here and we'll be working on all the pre-lab stuff. Okay. It's the only time where I'm going to give you an entire class period to work on the pre-lab stuff because it's your first high school lab and you actually have to write out the procedure, which is why I went through this today. So you know what tests you're going to run. You can make a detailed procedure on those Okay, on uh, on Monday when you're setting that up with your group. All right, so on Monday, I'll go over okay, uh, that lab in particular. Tomorrow, I'm going to go over lab reports in general. Okay, and then, uh, like I say, Monday, we'll work on it. Tuesday, we'll actually do the lab, and it'll take pretty much the whole class to get all of the uh, tests finished. Okay, and then it'll be due um, maybe by, by Friday or the following Monday. I'll decide when we get closer to the time. Okay, questions on that? Okay, what I want you guys to do is continue working on the naming worksheets from yesterday. Okay. Remember, I put all the keys in the stream yesterday, so if you're looking for the keys to check your answers, they're still in the stream from yesterday. Okay. I'll pull them, I'll pull up the sheets and put them back up on the board here.